Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne Chapter 33 In which Phileas Fogg shows himself equal to the circumstances An hour afterwards, the steamer Henrietta passed the lifeboat which marks the entrance of Hudson, turned Sandy Hook Point, and put to sea. During the day, she skirted Long Island and offing into the Fire Island light, and rapidly ran towards the east. At noon the next day, the 13th of December, the man w upon the bridge to take charge of the vessel, it would certainly be supposed that this man was Captain Speedy. Not at all, it was Felix Fogg. As for Captain Speedy, he was snugly uh, locked up in his cabin, howling at a rate that denoted an anger very pardonable, which amounted to a paroxysm. What, what, ha what had happened was very simple. Phileas Fogg wanted to go over to Liverpool, the captain would not take him there, and then Phileas Fogg had agreed to take the passage for Bordeaux. In thirty hours he had been on board, and he had maneuvered so well that with his banknotes, that the crew, sailors, and firemen, and occasional crew on bad terms with the captain, belonged to him. And this is why Phileas Fogg commanded in the place of Captain Speedy, while the captain was shut up in his cabin, and why, finally, the Henrietta was steering her course towards Liverpool. It was very clear seeing Mr. Fogg's maneuver that he had been a sailor. Now, how the adventure would come out would be known later, Mrs. Auda's easiness did not cease. She, although she said nothing, Fix was stunned at Passport 2, found the thing simply splendid. Between 11 and 12 knots, Captain Speedy had said, the Henrietta did maintain this average of a speed. If then, how many ifs yet? If the sea did not become too rough, the wind, if the winds did not rise from the east, if the no mishap occurred to the vessel, no accident to the engine, the Henrietta, in nine days, counting from the 12th of December to the 21st, could accomplish 3,000 miles separating New York from Liverpool. It is true that once arrived, Henrietta's affair upon the bank affair might take the general men a bit farther than he would like. During the first few days, they went along excellent conditions. The wind was not too rough, the wind seemed stationary in the northeast, and the sails were hoisted. In them, the Henrietta sailed like a dreary transatlantic steamer. Passport 2 was delighted in the last exploit of his master, the consequence of which he preferred not to consider, filled him with enthusiasm. The crew had never seen a gayer, more agile fellow. He had made a thousands of friendships with the sailor and astonished them by his acrobatic feats. He lavished upon them the best names and the most attractive drinks. He thought that they maneuvered like gentlemen, and that the firemen called up like heroes. His good humor was very communicative, communicative and impressed itself upon all. He had forgotten the past, which annoyances and its perils. He thought the only of the end, so re nearly reached, and sometimes he boiled over with impatience, as if he had been heated by the furnace of the Henry and frequently. Although the worthy fellow resolved and fixed, he looked at him with a distrustful eye, but yet he did not speak between to him, and there lo no longer existed any intimacy between these two old friends. Besides, Fix, it must be confessed, did not understand this thing at all. The conquest of the Henrietta, the purchase of her crew, and Fogg's maneuvering like an accomplished seaman, this combination of things confused him. He did not know what to think. But after all, a man who had commenced a stealing 55,000 pounds could finish by stealing a vessel. And Fix was naturally led to believe that the Henrietta, directed by Fogg, was not going to Liverpool at all, but in some quarter of the world where the robber, become a pirate, or quietly placed himself in safety. This hypothesis, it must be confessed, was not could be not more plausible, and the detective commenced to regret very seriously having entered upon this affair. As for Captain Speedy, he continued to howl in his cabin, and Passport Two, whose duty was to provide his meals, did only with the greatest precautions. Although he was so strong, and Mr. Fogg had no longer the appearance of even suspecting that there was a captain on board. On the 13th, they passed the edge of the banks of newfound land. Those ba are bad latitudes. During the winter especially, the fogs are frequent there. The blows are dreadful. And since the day before the barometer has suddenly fallen, indicating an approach of change in the atmosphere, and, in fact, during the night when the tem temperature varied, the cold became keener, and at the same time the wind shifted into the southeast. This was a misfortune. Mr. Fogg, in order not to be driven out of his course, had to reef the sails <coughs> and increase his steam. But the progress of the ship was slackened, and 
Owning to the condition of the sea, whose long ways broke against her stern, she was violently tossed about, and to the detriment of her speed. The breeze increased in by degrees to a hurricane, and it was already probable that the events of the Henrietta might not be able to hold herself right against the waves. Now, if she had to fly before the storm, unknown and with all bad chances, threatened them. Passepartout darkened at the same time as the sky for two days. The good fellow was in mortal dread, but Felix Fogg was a bold sailor who knew, who knew how to keep head against the sea and kept on his horse without even putting the vessel under a small head of steam. The Henrietta, whenever she could rise with a wave, passed over it, but her deck was swept from end to end. Sometimes, too, when a mountain wave r rised the, the stern out of the water, the screw came out of the water, beating air the air with its blades, but the sh ship still moved right on. The wind did not become as severe as might have been feared. It was not one of those hurricanes which might sweep on with a velocity of 90 miles an hour. It continued quite fresh, but unfortunately it blew off suddenly from the southeast, and did not allow the sails to be hoisted. And yet, as we will see, it would have been very useful if they could come to the aid of the steam. The 16th of December was the 75th day <clears throat> elapsed of leading, leaving London, and Henrietta had not yet seen the serious delay in the half of the voyage, and was nearly accomplished. In the worst local days had been passed. In the summer, the success would have been certain, and in the winter, they were break at mercy of the bad weather, and Passepartout did not speak. Secretly, he hoped that if the wind failed them, he counted at least upon the steam. Now, on this day, the engineer ascended the deck, met Mr. Fogg, and talked earnestly to with him. Not knowing why, by a presentiment, doubtless, Passepartout felt a sort of vague uneasiness that he, he would have given one of his ears to have heard with the other what was being said. But he could only catch a few words, and among the others, uttered by his master. You are certain of what you say? I am certain, sir, replied the engineer. Don't forget that, since our departure, all our furnaces have been going, and we have, although we have enough coal going under our, a small head from steam from New York to Bordeaux, we have not enough for a whole, full head of steam from New York to Liverpool, Liverpool. I will take the matter under consideration, replied Mr. Fogg. Passport 2 understood. A mortal field took possession of him. The co was about to give out. Ah, uh, if my master award that off, he said to himself, he would certainly be a famous man. And after, after having met Fix, he, he could not help opposing himself as to the situation. Then, replied the detective, with such teeth, you believe that we are going to Liverpool? I do indeed. <laughs> Idiot, replied the detective, shrugging his shoulders and turning away. Passport 2 was on the point of sharply resenting the epith, whose true signification could not, he could not understand, but he said to himself that unfortunate fix <clears throat> must be very much disappointed and humiliated by his self-esteem, and so much having awkwardly fo <clears throat> followed a false scent around the world, he would have refrained from condemning him. And now, of what course Phileas Fogg was going to take? It was difficult to guess, but it appeared that the phlegmatic gentleman decided on one, and for that evening he sent the engineer and said to him, Keep your fires and continue to on the course until complete exhaustion of the fuel. A few moments later, the smokestack of the Henrietta was vomiting torrents of smoke. The vessel... The vessel continued then to sail under full steam, but as he had announced two days later, the 18th, the engineer had informed that the coal would give out during the day. Don't let the fires go out, replied Mr. Fogg. On the contrary, let the valves be charged. On about noon of day, having taken observations and calculated the position of the vessel, Mr. Fogg sent Passport 2 and ordered him to go to ca for Captain Speedy. This good fellow felt as if he had been committed to unchain the tiger, I, and he descended into the poop, saying to himself, Possibly I shall find a madman. In fact, a few minutes later, a bomb came onto the poop deck, and then Mr. Cross an oath. This bomb was Captain Speedy. It was evident that he, it was going to burst. Where are we? were the first words he uttered. <laughs> In the midst of his choking... Anger. He, and certainly, it was a worthy man. He had been uh, apoplectic. He would have never recovered from it. Where are we? He repeated his face purple. Seven hundred and seventy, seven hundred and seventy miles from Liverpool. Replied Mister Fogg with impudent calmness. Pirate. Replied Andrew Speedy. I have sent <clears throat> for you, sir. Ski skimmer. Sir continued. Phileas Fogg to ask you to sell me your ship. No, by all devils, no. I shall be obliged to burn her. To burn my ship. 
release her upper portions, for we are out of fuel. Burn my ship! cried Captain Speedy, who can no longer pronounce his syllables. A ship that's worth fifty thousand dollars. Here's sixty thousand, replied Phyllis Fogg, offering him a roll of banknotes. This produced a powerful effect on Andrew Speedy. No American is without <clears throat> emotion at the sight of sixty thousand dollars. The captain forgot in an instant his anger, imprisonment, and all the grievances of his passenger. This ship was twenty years old. It might be quite a bargain. The bomb could not explode, and Phyllis Fogg had withdrawn the fuse. The iron hull will be left me, he said in a singularly softened tone. The iron hull in the engine, sir. Is it a bargain? A bargain. And Andrew Speedy, snatching the rolls of blank notes, counted them and slipped them into his pocket. During the scene, Passport 2 was as white as a sheet. For Fix, he nearly expected an ap apoplectic fit. Nearly 20,000 pounds spent in this fog was certainly going to relinquish to the seller the hull and the engine. That is nearly the entire value of the vessel. It is true that the sum stolen from the bank amounted fifty-five thousand pounds, and when Andrew Speedy had pocketed his money, Mr. Fogg said to him, "Sir, don't let this all astonish you. I know that I lose twenty thousand pounds if I am not in London on the twenty-first of December, and at a quarter of nine in the evening. Now that I've missed a steamer from New York, as you refuse to take me to Liverpool, and I have done well by all imps of the lower regions," I cried Andrew Speedy, "since I make it." By at least forty thousand dollars, he added more calmly. Do you know one thing, Captain Fogg? <clears throat> well, Captain Fogg, there is something of the Yankees in you. And having paid his passenger what he thought to be a compliment, he went away. Phil Fogg said to him, "Now the ship belongs to me, certainly, from the keel to the truck of the masts, all would understand." Very well. <clears throat> Cut away the inside arrangement and fire up with the brie. It may be judged how much this dry wood was necessary to maintain the sea of a su suffocant pressure. The day, the poop deck, the cabin, and the bunks, and the spare deck <clears throat> all went. The next day, the 19th of December, they burned the mast, and the rafts, and the spars. They cut down the mast and delivered them to the axe. The crew displayed an incredible zeal. Passport two, hewing, cutting, and sawing, did the work of ten men. It was a perfect fury of demolition. And the next day, the twentieth, the railings of the armor, all of the ship above the water, and the greatest part, the greater part of the deck, were consumed. And Henrietta was now a vessel cut into a pontoon. But on this day, they sighted the coast of Ireland and Fastnet. However. At ten o'clock in the evening, the ship was only passing Queen Ta Queenstown. Phyllis Fogg had only twenty-four hours to reach London. Now this was the time that Henrietta needed to reach Liverpool, even under full headway, and the steam was about to fail the bold gentleman. Sir, replied Captain Speedy to him, who had come to interest in his projects, I really pity you. Everything is against you. We are only yet in front of Queenstown. Ah, uh, <clears throat> said Phyllis Fogg. That is Queenstown, the place where we perceive light? Yes, can we enter the harbor? Not for three hours, only at high tide. Let us wait, Phyllis Fogg said calmly, without letting be seen that <clears throat> on his last inspiration he was going to try to conquer once more his contrary fate. Queenstown is a port on the coast of Ireland in which transatlantic steamers are coming from the United States to post, deposit their mailbags. These letters are carried to Dublin by the express trains, <clears throat> always ready to start. From Dublin, they arrive to Liverpool in very swift vessels, thus gaining twelve hours over the most rapid sailors of the ocean companies. These twelve hours, of which the Mirko couriers gained, Phyllis Fogg intended to gain too. Instead of arriving at Henrietta in the evening of the next day at Liverpool, he would be there by noon. Consequently, he would have time enough to reach London before a quarter of nine in the evening. Towards one o'clock in the morning, the Henrietta entered Queenstown Harbour at high tide, and Phil's Fogg, having received a vigorous shake of the hand by Captain Speedy, left him on the leveled hulk of this vessel, still worth half of what he sold it for. The passengers landed immediately, fixed at the moment, and had a fierce desire to arrest Mr. Fogg. He did not do it, however. Why? What conflict was going on within him? Had he changed his mind with the reference of Mr. Fogg? Did he finally take the receive that he was mistaken? Fix, however, did not leave Mr. Fogg. With him, it was out on passport two, who did not take time to breathe. He jumped into a train at Queenstown at half past one in the morning, arrived at Dublin at the break of day, and immediately embarked on one of those steamers, regular steel spindles, all engine in with detaining to rise from the waves and vertically pass right through them.
At the 20 minutes before noon, in 21st of December, Phileas Fogg landed on the crater of Le Liverpool. He was only six hours from London. At this moment, Fix approached him and put his hand on his shoulder and showing his warrant. I said, you Are you really Phileas Fogg? <clears throat> yes, sir. I arrest you in the name of the Queen.